this is, as he said, Weird Stuff First Day Covers. It is kind of my specialty. Like most people, I have other things I collect. Uh, trombones on stamps is my big joke because there are always six U.S. stamps that show a trombone and usually tiny. Uh, I collect o o official caches having a tie-in uh, and just anything that, that strikes my fancy, including dragon cards. Somebody has to collect them. Um, this is a basic first day cover. So is the next slide I'm going to show you. It's kind of boring. It's a stamp, it's a cancel, and it's an envelope. Could be a card. Uh, this is a stamped envelope, but it's still machine cancel. Uh, nothing special about it. Um, and that's it. That's a first day cover. There's nothing that says it has to be anything more. But most people see something more in first day covers. Now, I want to show you this one. Now, if you look at it, you'll say, boy, that's that's kind of ratty. I mean, it's got a bright ink address to me and uh, no cache and it's not in great shape and a machine cancel. You have to know the story behind it. And that's true on a lot of things, which was there was no grace period in 1964. And I was going off to summer camp and I had just started collecting U.S. first day covers. And I was beside myself because I was going to miss two of them. And I came home and I found my father had serviced them for me. That's his handwriting. Anybody who knew my father knew that was him. And um, so the cover is worthless to everybody else. But to me, it's priceless. This is an interesting one because this woman, Claire Health, did a lot of servicing in the 1920s. It's number five envelope and uh, U522A Liberty Bell, and it's addressed to her. She was a clerk in the U.S. Patent Office who serviced several other issues in this period. I don't know much else about her. Sometimes the covers were addressed. I, I drove Eric away already. Sometimes the covers were addressed to her at her home. Sometimes they were addressed to her at the patent office, which is how people know that that's where she worked. Um, didn't do any selling or, or cachet making of her own that we know of. Now, this almost looks the same as the previous ones, but this has something added. This is a corner card for the Hotel Buchanan. The stamp honors Wheatland, the home of President Buchanan, who lived in Lancaster. See, I got the name right, I practiced. Uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where the hotel is, where the stamp was issued, where Wheatland is located. So there's a little bit more to this one than you might think. Now, you can embellish your first day covers, even the standard first day cover with the standard cachet by adding multiple stamps. And nothing gets weirder, by the way, than a Ziploc on first day covers, because among my other specialties are Ziploc first days. I am probably the foremost collector of Ziploc first day covers in the country, because I'm probably the only collector of them. Uh, and I have an almost complete collection, but you can add a plate block. Many people did that, and it makes your cover a little bit different. Here, back in 1932, uh, this collector added four stamps so we could get the airmail rate to Oakland, California. And it's a number five size envelope, which tells you right there it's an Adam Burt, even though the cachet looks like the lint print for or my note is here someplace uh, Malone 13 no it's uh, anyway it's similar to the Lynn print for this issue Lynn George Lynn the same one who did one stamp news uh, produced for other cachet makers using his designs and that's what this is so it's a little bit different and also the neat markings on it now sometimes they issue different stamps on the same day, same place, all part of the same issue. This is the defense issue of 1940. Uh, if you care, it's Malone number 13. It's a Grimsland. Um, but nothing special about it other than the fact that it's three different stamps. They were not C tenants. So a little extra work went into making this, cash, this first day cover. Now, these were all issued on the same day, even though they really don't look anything alike. You've got horizontal pairs. They're all electric eye issues. The um, special delivery stamp, E15, is it? E15EE is very different. Uh, it is a Clifford cachet, and he used 
stars you see they are onto the right and left of uh, the title but there's different numbers of stars I guess his mood a lot of the early early cachet makers were printers and so they could change designs every other cover if they wanted and they often did want so that's that's a fun one and you wouldn't think that these stamps had any connection other than the fact that they were all issued on the same day and two of them are of course are from the same series now we're going to look at different types of printing this these are uh, this is a commercial offset by spectrum and um interestingly seymour nussenbaum was the man behind spectrum caches and i was at nojex yesterday and Foster said, you know, if you look to your right in the wheelchair, there's Seymour Nussenbaum going through the boxes of stamps. He's 98 years old and he's still collecting. But he's, I love I loved these caches and I wish I'd had a chance to tell him that, but uh, when I turned around, he wasn't there anymore. So uh, this one is commercial inkjet printer and it's heritage and you see their second printing, um, just a little bit different um what other notes do i have for you the home computer inkjet printed um this is one of the my favorites in the collection and one of the things i got out of putting together the exhibit for great american stamp show was i researched a lot of this stuff a lot of these cache makers and i learned all sorts of fascinating things this is by robert f bolton he did caches in this period the mid 40s when he was an early television commercial producer. He did sets for uh, both the commercials and for uh, trade shows for companies like Revlon. And uh, earlier he had printed, he had painted murals for the World's Fairs in Chicago and New York in the 30s. Uh, it is printed and colored. Uh, do I have the picture? No, I don't have the picture with uh, ready, but uh, it's it's back stamped with his signature, even though the Malone catalog uh, calls it cache maker unknown or designer unknown in 2006 because nobody looked on the back of the envelope. Um, he often used blocks of four when he did this. Now, the man came back to cache making in his late 90s, back to stamp collecting, back to cache making. Uh, sort of self-promoted himself into a write-up in Linz as being the oldest cachet maker ever because he was approaching his 100th birthday and still making cachets. And he promoted himself with a picture of a snake wrapped around his neck for the year of the snake issue. A, a real character. But um, I, I just love his material. And I collected this because, it, oh, it's oversized. I think I mentioned that. It's about five by seven. So it doesn't get... You know, a lot of people won't even look at it. Dealers won't put it in their boxes or <clears throat> one dealer I know used to fold covers to make them fit in his boxes. And I had to stop going because I started <laughs> to cry <laughs> when I saw that. Anyway, um, this is a famous stamp collector, relatively famous stamp collector. It is silk screened. It is what you might call a semi official cancellation. We're getting a little weird here because the stamp was issued in San Francisco but not with this postmark. Uh, anybody want to guess who the uh, cachet maker is? Mike, did you look at my exhibit in, uh, no. <laughs> Leonard Piskowitz, who is best known as the former editor of US Stamps, the US Stamp Society, before that the Bureau uh, Issues Association. Uh, but even he played with or, or dabbled in cachet making. And uh, it, it's a rather striking cache. Again, you don't see a lot of silk screen. Now, Dave and I were talking before. This was done by an art student named Tony Chickalella. And I loved his material because there were also the different techniques. This was done with felt tipped pens. Remember flare pens? We all had them in college. I mean, the different fine tipped felt markers. And he was using this. He told me. I, I met up with him in uh, Napex. He was laid off and he was finding time to collect stamps again. No money, but time. And um, he told me that he used it to practice the different techniques he had to learn as an art student. 
And uh, here's another one. These are little strips of paper, tiny tissue paper, colored tissue paper, carefully glued in place. I actually thought until I took the cover out of the sleeve 20 years later that it was uh, cut and that those were colors in the insert, but no, they're strips of paper glued onto it, which also took extremely fine work. I mean, I don't have the hand for that, um, even if I had had the concept. So it's otherwise a mundane cachet. I mean, it's a definitive issue with the machine cancel. Eh. But the cachet, I think, is striking. So what's next? Uh, I was told after I put the exhibit together, this was done by George Alexander. Uh, when I knew him in the 70s in Washington, he was he was quite a character. He did a lot of photocopy sheets to eight and a half by 11. Um, and he encouraged the blinded veterans of America, but, but worked right there, Blinded Veterans Association, to produce a set of four caches. And here are the other three, which, you know, red and blue, I mean, they're okay, but this one I think is striking because that's a coin that has been restamped, you know, the things you get at tourist attractions and elongated into a penny and then inserted and it goes through to the back. There's a cellophane uh, cover on both sides of it. You can go and look at the back of the former penny, I guess, because I don't think you want to keep using it. Um, so now collectors have been using or cache makers, first day cover collectors have been using rubber stamps since first day covers began. The one shown here was applied to, as far as is known, every Lindbergh stamp issued that day and postmarked in St. Louis, whether it was cached already or not. This one was not, but every, Lin, every St. Louis postmarked first day cover for this issue has this rubber stamp on it from, I guess, an overzealous postal clerk or somebody. Um, I don't know where Mohawk New York is. I don't even know if it's still there. And then there's mine. And this was produced as a promotion for Delphi's Stamps, Coins, and Postal Forum, which later became the Virtual Stamp Club. Actually, it was one of seven virtual stamp clubs I was operating. And I printed these on site and handed them out as a promotion. And it's really two rubber stamps. The Mickey is a commercial rubber stamp I bought in an art supply store. And I had courtesy Delphi stamps, coins, and postal form. And I brought rubber stamp pads for each color. And at first, I did it with the cachet on the left and the stamp on the right. And then I said, wait a second. Then the cornet player isn't facing the conductor. I may be a trombone player, but I know you're supposed to watch the conductor. So I switched it. And so most of them are produced this way. But you will find a couple of some place if people haven't thrown them out that have Mickey on the other side conducting to nobody, which is the way they feel often. Um, there's a joke with it that musicians tell about the uh, second trombone player who is suddenly drafted to conduct one night because the conductor is ill. The next night he's back in the section. The first trombone player turns to him and says, where were you last night? Uh, <laughs> I was telling this to um, my wife's cousin, who's a professional violinist, and, and she laughed and said, we tell that joke about violists. So it, <laughs> it's fairly universal. Um, yeah. We're getting now into more unofficial location. And I think that's a better name than unofficial postmark. It's an unofficial location postmark because this is an official US Postal Service postmark. It's just not the designated first day city. Jim Thorpe went to a special school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, even though he was born in Oklahoma. The stamp was issued in Oklahoma. Somebody, probably Doug Howe, H-O-L-L, who was Uncovers, and Uncovers, he specialized in UOs, as they are also known, and uh, had them postmarked there. Now, there's a great story on this one. This is a TM Weddle cache. Uh, and he confirmed the story to me via Facebook the, just this summer, but he's not the culprit here. George Vanatta, who did some strange things, 
hired a private airplane to fly this out of Las Cruces, New Mexico, or wherever the stamps were issued, because that was the first day city. Then it went to another plane to be flown to Columbus, Ohio. And it's probably in the insert that's here. What's the connection with Columbus, Ohio, you say? I mean, Smokey wasn't there. The, the State Fair, at least at that time, every year had a giant statue of Smokey Bear. And so that's the connection. But just the lengths, somebody would go some 1,300 miles to airplanes. I think they paid the pilot of a commercial jet for the second leg. He can't possibly have made the money back. I met up with, I can't put this in my exhibit or any articles. I met George Van Natta at the uh, Eleanor Roosevelt first day in 84. And he was servicing covers. His mother was there helping him. And he told me he had cashed in his retirement accounts to buy more stamps for first day covers. Now, this is the 1980s. And there's a big run up in first day cover prices. And everybody thought they were going to get rich. And I said, oh, my God, if I did that, my wife would divorce me. And his mother looked up and said, I would have divorced him, too. So um, I don't know where he is now, but uh, he's not doing anything. There is my um, effort. I did not go 1,300 miles. In fact, I didn't go anywhere to get this unofficial location because the FDR library has its own station and had its own postmark. And I, as far as I know, they still do. And so I just basically turned around and said, no, I want that one instead of the Later, I did drive down to New York City, where I serviced them at the FDR station on New York's Manhattan's east side. And unfortunately, I still have lots of them left. Um, you may recognize the work on this. Uh, is it signed? Uh, I think it's signed on the back, but it's Panda Caches. Uh, and uh, Rollin and company. It's, a joint issue, which makes it more interesting and a little weirder right there, but it's also a UO, Geneva, Illinois. The stamp was, the U.S. stamp was issued in Washington. So he has both stamps, they both have their country's postmarks, but Geneva is, is an unofficial location. And I, I think it's rather attractive and different. That's, that's the whole idea of my collection. Now here's one. And I have to admit, I have goofed on this. When he can, advertising manager Mark Thompson, the ad manager for First Days, sends out the invoices in one of his number 10 window envelopes, and he takes them to the Memphis or to the Nashville post office and puts the, gets a new stamp and gets them postmarked. Some get a hand cancel, some get nothing. This one got the machine spray on. Um, I did open the first one, not paying any attention to what it is, um, and kind of destroyed it. If you're not careful, that's what happens, but it's, it's a commercial use. Now, is it a non-philatelic use? Oh, geez, you'd have to ask an APS judge about that because he's a stamp collector. It was sent to a stamp collector, but it was used to carry mail. I mean, a real mail, my bill was in there. <laughs> Now, this is a th this is a three year project involving three first day covers. In fact, it doesn't really fit on an eight and a half by eleven sheet. Um, the top of well, when I put it in a in a uh, page protector sleeve protector for the uh, exhibiting, the top of the th top four stamps and the brown border are actually sticking out of it and sticking into the next the page above it. Uh, I've gotten away with it though. And when you, it's a hand colored cachet, and this is the, the first 13 states as they ratified it. The US issued a stamp for each state because it was their, their statehood dates. You have to hold your breath on a project like this because it only takes one mistake or one screw up, and your whole project, or at least that whole cover, that whole set is garbage. And I had that with this. This is a five-year series for the Civil War. I chose the machine cancel. I had no idea what the digital color postmarks were going to look like. Um, and I did run into a mishap because for the 2013 stamp, I was unemployed. 
that's when I went down to North Carolina for a new job, new career, new everything, and they fired me after nine weeks. So I had no money, but I had lots of time to put these together. And luckily, I brought them with me from New Jersey. Uh, but again, all it takes is one mistake. The cachet, which is in the middle right column, is taken from a Civil War patriotic. And then I chose the pebble grain um, background. Now, in a, in a chat like this, in a, in, online, this looks like a normal first day cover, just an all over cachet. It's made out of wallpaper. And uh -huh. I got interested a few years ago and ended up writing about this for Lynn Stamp News. I contacted the man who put it together and he's kind of not out of it. But for a period, he was using a lot of wallpaper, he used other things like wrapping paper and all the rest, but his favorite was wallpaper. And finding wallpaper that would go with the stamp subject was the challenge for him. And you can see over there, it's kind of hidden by our uh, thumbnails, but there's the stamp and then you can tell other sides of it are all these fake metals, or maybe they're real metals, but they don't look like real ones to me. And uh, he cut and folded it using a template. It's kind of nifty. These, this is made out of balsa wood. It is one of four designs for this issue, I believe. Let me check my notes. And it, it's funny here. I, when I started researching for my exhibit, and I was saying, oh gosh, I have to be able to back all this stuff up, and it turned out nobody cared because of the type of exhibit it was. I went and looked up articles and I found somebody had written about this and it was me. 35 years ago, I'd written about this cachet in first days. It's amazing what you find there. I'd forgotten about it, but it reminded me that I had interviewed a member of the Coin Collectors Club that put this together. And the Sybil Ludington, Ludington, Ludington stamp was issued in, um, Dutchess County, New York, which is above Westchester, some 40, 50 miles north of, of New York City. Uh, it is an eight cent stamp, so it wasn't first class. The first class rate was 10 cents. And the other three stamps in this issue, series were all 10 cent stamps, but they did four different caches for their local stamp, and it's where the stamp was postmarked. They're all balsa wood. They're really hard to find because they break. You know what balsa wood is like. Uh, I have been in, in the 80s, I would go into dealer boxes and you'd see like balsa wood dust in the bottom of the bin of the stamp of the cover boxes. And you knew that some of these covers had met their maker. Um, and in fact, in my exhibit, I have a very thick piece of cardboard behind the page to make sure nobody bends it. Uh, but they do break. I have the other three or four of them for the series, but uh, I don't know if I can find them. And I don't know what, if, if, they, if they have survived me and my messy ways, but this is a piece of leather. Um, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Uh, Elena Cornejo, is that correct, Dave? From the Reese chapter for a period was doing pieces of leather as her caches. It's a first day cover size, number six and three quarter size. And then she would work the illustrations in and color them. So here is a stamp. There were three varieties of it issued at our convention. Um, nobody cares about the issue. I haven't sold one of these in got to be close to 30 years. And, uh, and the show wasn't even that long ago. But this is unique. I mean, this is very different and it's thick also, which is why it's on the same page as the balsa wood one, because you have to make, I, I'm sure if I bent it, it would crack at this point. Ah. But it's a nice piece of leather. This is an applique first day cover. Uh, Denise Lazaroff under the name 3D Laz FDCs is using scrapbooking technique. She is a scrapbooker first and then decided to get into first day covers. And so the dreidel, that's the little top on the left, um, sticks out from the, from the cover. Again, a digital you can't tell, but, but it does. Now I put it against the dark blue background, not because the way exhibitors do, because it's a super expensive or rare item. Uh, you know, there are what, uh, 
27 of them made, but to show you that it's on vellum. It's not on paper either. And I wanted you to be able to see that it's translucent. You can see through it. And so that's why the dark background. By the way, they got the letters right, unlike that first version of the US postmark for this year's Hanukkah stamp where they screwed up and they got the letter wrong. They've uh, revised the um, postmark. Dave, you were really looking at this one, so I'm gonna wait. How did she do the, the snow, I guess, come, the snow coming down? Are I don't those... know. I don't know offhand. Um, I'd, I'd have to take the cover out, and I already did it once today, and I don't know if I want to. <laughs> I took it no, out no, that's... It. Um, no. It's over there somewhere. Nice. Um, this it is also what It kind of looked like it was printed on, on the paper. That that snow oh, like right. that, that that was cut. Oh, you're I'll probably. Try, I'll try to multitask. You see, this is where the single pages are inside this folder, uh, and see if I can take a look at it and find out. But this is also appliques. The baseball player sliding. The uh, the word safe. They're all cutouts. And uh, again, her things are. You don't you don't go to a printer and go to the three D printer and have these done. They just. They have to be handmade. Um, I believe it's signed on the back. Just one. Now, you can take a boring cachet, and I'm sorry, may he rest in peace. Gary Dubnik isn't here to get upset. That's Garrick. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's an okay cachet, but it's black and white. You can add another country stamp. And there's Lou Gehrig from a place he probably never heard of, never visited. But um, it adds something to the cover and makes it a little bit more interesting. Now, the US is the only country I know of, there may be others, but it's certainly the biggest first day cover country that allows you to postmark anything as long as there is a US stamp of sufficient first class value. But they'll, they'll do anything. And to prove it, that's a sticker that I put on a dragon card for the, base, for the basketball stamp. And I have a number of these uh, in the exhibit. This is this one is not in my exhibit currently. I didn't have a chance to pull it out of the exhibit, but I have another one for the Blue Jays, another convention special stamp that nobody ever cares about. And I found a sticker that looked like a Blue Jay stamp, but it's cartoonish. And I put that next to the Blue Jay single, the real stamp, and had them postmarked, and they'll do it. So it's kind of fun. By the way, the um, this is an early um, computer graphic produced cache because you can see it's ink dot ink. It's a dot matrix printer. Boy, it's been so long I forgot how to say that. So is the text, by the way. And I had to put a new ribbon in, and of course, make sure I got a really good print before taking it to the printer. But back here in the uh, the first decade of dragon cards, I had to pay extra to have text, which is why dragon cards to this day don't have a lot of text on them because I had back then I had to pay for it. I had to pay to have everything scanned. So this one I got around them. What the heck? Now, anybody know who did this one? Yeah, right. Uh, this is interesting because inset in the Cache, as Dave probably can tell you better than I can. Look at that young guy standing there behind the, uh, the old man at the drawing table. Uh, is an actual animation cell, or what could have been an animation cell, except I'm sure you didn't have different poses that would move as you went along and stuff. But, uh, and it's autographed. So it's an autographed cover. The stamp was issued in New York, so it's an unofficial location. Hand-painted. You don't get these printed hand assembled i mean it just it just ticks off so many check boxes it's it's kind of fun and it comes with the insert which i i show in the uh, this illustration now collectors for a long time have been producing maximum cards as they're called and the idea is to get what they call concordance that is to say the cancel and the stamp and the postcard show the same image or as close as possible without any of them having been manufactured to make a maximum card. 
So when a foreign country says, and we have this set of maximum cards for you, they're not because they produced them for that purpose. They would not qualify under international exhibiting rules. Now, most many of us who collect maximum cards, and I actually did that before dragon cards, we'll just say the heck with FIP, the International Federation of the Lottery Rules, but uh, we would use commercial postcards. But there's a problem there that in the bad old days of lick and stick stamps, they'd fall off after a time. And the ink would take forever to dry unless you sent them to Kansas City. And so on this one, I, you hopefully can't tell, but I used a glue stick to put it back on. And that probably violates 16 different parts of World Series of Philately, exhi Philately Exhibiting to do that. But they'll never see this Zoom presentation anyway. And I'm never going to win a grand anyway. So what the heck? You know, I'm, I'm safe. So anyway, that's uh, I got to say, I like self-adhesive stamps for maximum cards because they stay on the cards. One of the problem. Now, at first, these two Bugs Bunny maximum cards and they do qualify, look identical. They were picture postcards the Postal Service produced. And in the middle, you'll see that there's an indicia or the stamp image on the other side that paid the postage and it reproduced the stamp image. I put the stamp on the face of the postcard and had both sides postmarked. So it's a dual cancel, maximum card. But the one on the right isn't a postcard. That's the cover for the booklet pack. And I carefully cut it off, trim the edges, and it's slightly larger than the picture postcard. And uh, on some of them, instead of having the back side, instead of putting the stamp on the face, I use the Bugs Bunny rubber stamp. And absolutely nobody wants that one. <laughs> now, the Postal Service in 99, again, issued the same idea. It's picture postcards. I keep wanting to point to the screen, but you won't see what I'm pointing to. I guess if I use my mouse, uh, they issued a, um, there it is, a uh, picture postcard with the stamp designs reproduced, paying the, post the postcard rate, which is what? Back then, 20 something cents? Now, whatever it is, it's less. And um, I put the stamps on the front, but I didn't stop there. They came in a box that you could use to mail the set to your friends. I put a stamp that matched the picture that they had on the box. This is the closest I am going to come to a three dimensional object in my exhibit because you can't close the frame otherwise. As it is, I've smushed the box. I do have some larger items uh, over there on a bookshelf. I have uh, Jay Bagalki put uh, a ship in a bottle, put the stamp on the outside, and had it postmarked and mailed back. Famously, he used a rubber flip flop from from I think the Virgin Islands or someplace. I did not get one of those, but other people have them, so they don't fit. In, they wouldn't fit in a frame. I could do it, but they'd have to pay extra for a. Uh, and this exhibit isn't going. I'm not going to get that sort of cooperation. <laughs> so, um, no. Anyway, I, I did it, everything I could. Uh, I have disassembled the box at times, but basically I kept it this way so that you can see that it's a box. And you were even given the instruction, that, you know, reverse the box and put tab A into tab B and you can mail this to somebody. And then said I made a first day cover out of it. You can recycle. It's very much, you know, an in thing right now. Again, a fairly boring Artcraft, John Muir, first day from 1964, but the Postal Service likes to repeat subjects. And John Muir was again a stamp as part of Celebrate the Century. And I don't know if it was me or somebody else took what probably would have been in a 50 cent box, machine canceled, and added the second stamp. Makes it more interesting, makes it weird. Now, there's a story behind this. Um, I have a story behind everything I, what I did for a living. That's the cover of Sports Illustrated from about three, four years before the stamps were issued. And I saved it, figuring it would come in handy someday that there'd be a balloony stamp or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm a pack rat. And when they announced the stamps, I wrote to Sports Illustrated and I asked to buy I don't know what quantity of back issues, this back issue, and they said, no, we'll always sell you 12. 
So 13 of these were made. And I also used the interior illustrations with the stamps. Everything sold. This is, I don't have, I, well, I have the other ones myself. I have one of each in my collection somewhere. Scary, I could probably tell you where. But um, they sold very, very quickly. This was a very popular issue. Um, I, it's safe to tell the story now, but a well-known chief philatelic judge decided to be the first responder on my exhibit. This is the first time I exhibited. And he held it up at the critique and said, now everybody knows there's a million of these. And oh. I wrote my next Lynn's column, no, there's not a million of these, there's 13 of them. And he was so embarrassed, he asked me to stop telling the story, so I did. But Bud, <laughs> Bud, is, Bud is passed on, so we can do that now, as Bud Sellers. And he's a very nice man. I felt, now I feel bad about it, but, uh, but not then. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I have the other version? Yes, I do. These are book covers. So these are real covers, used as covers. And getting them was, this is a larger version if you want to see it, was difficult because the way paperback publishing worked at the time, this is late 1970s, 1979 is the issue. If, you, if the bookseller couldn't sell the book, he could return the cover, just the cover, to the publisher and get his costs back. And they would return the covers and a lot of unscrupulous booksellers would then sell the rest of the book to a used bookstore. So I went to a used bookstore in Washington, DC and spent hours trying to find books by John Steinbeck that still had the cover on them. I mean, I wasn't gonna buy a new one. And frankly, the new versions of his books at the time didn't look that good. They were these high school editions that just had lettering. So I wanted, I wanted the illustrations and I couldn't find, and, and the book dealer kept saying, well, here's a nice, it's in great shape. I said, it doesn't have a cover. You're not gonna read the cover, are you? I said, I want a cover. <laughs> so he was very glad to see me go, I'm sure. Um, this is our calendar girl in more ways than one. This is a calendar page. Now look carefully at the postmark. I'll zoom in here. Last day of sale. Yeah. So I guess it doesn't really belong in this exhibit, but after they announced that they were going to do this short-lived promotion, that was a Frank Thomas concept. They were. I was in a bookstore waiting online, a Barnes and Noble, and I saw that they had a bunch of. 19, I guess, 96 calendars, desk calendars and other things on sale at a discount because it was March. And I picked up 12 of these, cut the pages, and I have, I think there were 16 different pages. And I, unfortunately, I haven't really sold them as much as I could. They sell well when I put them out, when I remember. They're not dragon cards, but they are my creation, so I'm allowed to sell them at Cachet Makers Bourses. Um, that's probably one of the more famous pictures, but uh, there are 16 different ones. And on the back, you can see the following month, I guess it is. So if, if this were March, I think the April calendar is on the back of it. <laughs> and they're just a little smaller than eight and a half by 11. I don't know what this is. Um, it's a sheet of paper. It's printed on the sort of paper that magazines were printed on in the 1950s. Think National Geographic or Life Magazine, Look Magazine. Full color. It's probably the logo. It is the logo or a logo for the celebration of the 250th anniversary. But why would somebody print it on a sheet of magazine paper? The best guess is that it was a proof that the printer wanted to see if the colors and the registration were good and matched and lined up. And then since he may have been a stamp collector or somebody with access to his waste was a stamp collector, they grabbed it and put the stamp and postmark on it. So that's 1951, obviously, and it's one of the earlier pieces here. Another one of these, I don't know what it is. It is a folder. It is about nine and a half by 12. Uh, it's blank inside. My guess is it was made for menus. 
the color picture the color picture is a printed photograph that's been pasted on not completely and then somebody went to town on a civil war combo on it i've i have i had a number of them when i was dealing but i never saw one with anything inside so i don't know for sure what they were and nobody has come forward to tell me now this is another story uh, for those of you who went to the Stanford, Connecticut Convention, first to AFDCS AmeriCover, um, while we were out on tour, the laundry room caught fire in the hotel and they had to evacuate the hotel. And we who were on the tour, well, actually we didn't, but the tour leader, which was um, Steve Ripley, got a, call, a frantic call from Mike Malone, the show promoter, saying, don't bring the bus back. We've got no place to put the people. So they let us off about two blocks from the hotel. We all got out and my son was with me and I, my younger son, Mark, went to a restaurant and there was this table decoration. And I just thought it was really funny because the place had certainly warmed up and it was more than a fire drill. And the exhibits were in a storeroom under the laundry room or above the they were really afraid that the water from the fire hoses might damage the exhibits. Oh. Yeah, so it was a close call and it probably wasn't funny to the show promoters, but I, I thought it was funny, you know. Um, I was only on the board at that point. I could laugh at everything and did. So that's again three dimensional. I, I could put it in the exhibit because it does fold up. Now you show this to a, a sports co memorabilia collector and he'll cry because this is a eight by 10 photo autographed with a Sharpie or Sharpies by Ralph Branca and Bobby Thompson before they passed away in Cooperstown. Every year they'd come up to Cooperstown and as most of the Hall of Fame inductees will if they can, and they'd sign autographs for people. I mean, they get paid in this, this, this memorabilia shop paid the two of them to come up. It, apparently it was a long time before Bobby Thompson could, um, or ra rather before Ralph Branca could come to terms with the fact that he will be forever remembered as the man who threw the home run pitch. I mean, it really bothered him. I mean, they lost the playoff game, sort of like my Mets. And, uh, but I took this and it cost $50 to buy this photograph. To a sports collector, it's probably not worth 20 cents anymore because I messed it up with the stamp and postmark. I'll stand by it. And as far as I know, it's the only one, at least for this design and whatever, I'm the only idiot who did this. Now, yes, I know I was waiting for Rollenberger or Foster Miller to be here and to tell me uh, the, the, the ruler is upside down, but this is the smallest first day cover in my collection, three and a half inches. And someplace here, it's two inches high. It is a sticker cache. There wasn't room for the whole postmark, so it's got a circular date stamp, which is a valid one. And I, in the exhibit, actually, the actual exhibit, I've got a better copy, better of the uh, ruler, but the um, image of the ruler is there just to show that size matters. <laughs> and then we go the other way. Even number 10 envelopes deserve some love. And this is every love stamp issued in 1991, all on the same day. And it is an art master cache printed onto the number 10 envelopes at my request. Now, by this point, we did have a grace period. So I was able to get the envelope because you can't get the envelope before the first day, but then you can't put the stamps on it. And no, I wasn't running out to Louisville, Kentucky, and then running out to Honolulu, Hawaii, all on the same day. I'm not sure that's even possible. So they printed the cache for me on the number 10s, and I may be the only person. Well, they probably did some for other clients at that point. And uh, it is an art, art master, yeah, as opposed to House of Farnham. But that's every, every stamp and piece of stationery issued that they filled out. This is, do I have a size on this one? Every, it's 10 by 13 inches. Every space related stamp that the US had issued up to this point of the space achievement in the upper left. Is that the right? No, it's the uh, I'm sorry, it's the uh, moon landing. 
every space stamp up to that date is on this. Um, wow. Yes. And um, it's kind of unusual for a commercial cachet maker to do something like this. Space is popular, but how many people are going to collect it? How many people will be able to store it? Even I have trouble storing some of this stuff. I'll tell you why in a moment on something. Um, the Postal Service issues more and more seat tenant, all different design, multi-stamp panes. And somebody decided to put it on this large envelope. Again, I think it's 10 by 13. And, um, and then had a postmark. The, the uh, cachet is printed separately and, and stuck on it. And actually, if you look carefully, only one stamp is postmarked. Uh -huh. I mean, if they'd been paying attention, they would have moved the cancel in more and in more on the other side. And then I, I sit there, I sit there now digitally playing with oversized dragon cards to make sure the cancels will hit as many things as possible so that this doesn't happen. But the person probably wasn't a mainstream one. And this is the biggest one in my collection. This has been the piece de resistance or the final piece in my collection because it takes four pages, which means it has to be at a certain point in the exhibit because it can't be in the middle of the row. It can't be at the end of the, you know, it's got to be, you can't have it, you can't do with one page and then go down to the next row for the rest. Of, no, it's four pages. It's 11 by 17 and it has a postmark for, I think, for almost every day of World Stamp Expo, at least every day that had a specific postmark. And wow. if it wasn't a first day, if it was a first day, it has those stamps. If it wasn't a first day, it ties in, the stamps tie in with the theme for the topic of the postmark. This was done by Alex Rogalski of Anagram. It is a card. And then he um, kind of hand colored around the edges and the border. Now, let's see what I've got up next. Ah, now this is an interesting cover by Dave, and it moves. If you pull the tab in the lower right, Tweety pops out of Sylvester's mouth. And Dave, I don't know if you remember this, but it's in my exhibit text. You didn't remember that you had changed colors on the lettering. Tougher and thuck tath. And you changed it in the middle. You see it's blue here. And in the later one, it's orange, orange and red. And I have two copies in my exhibit, and it has to be mounted carefully. Uh, by the way, the dragon card for this issue, I don't know how you got away with it, but the dragon card for this issue got me kicked out of the program. Warner oh. Brothers didn't like, didn't like my um, text where I had them saying something. I thought I saw a postage stamp. Oh. And um, they didn't like that. Then I changed the relative sizes of the bird and the uh, cat, and they just went ballistic and they threw me out. Hey. Here's another Dave Bennett. He wasn't supposed to be here because I was going to talk about him. But uh, if you open up the cover on the upper right, the tower, the what is it called? Central Tower? Terminal Tower. Terminal Tower, and that's where the train station used to be in Cleveland. Yes. And uh, it pops up, and Dave is a native of Cleveland. But again, it's got an unofficial location postmark. The stamps were issued at Stamp Show 1999. But it doesn't have that, and it doesn't have the first day of issue. Um, and it's, it's very nice. I've got a number of his pop-ups. I can only show, well, I could show many, but I'm told that gets you uh, in trouble. And then uh, this is Hideaki Nakano. And Hideaki is known for his warped mind. Um, if you met him in person, he was. He took a, I think it's a number 10, Liberty Bell envelope. Um, someplace I have written down which one, what the Scott number is, if you care. Uh, it's got his Perfin initials in the indicia, the stamp part. He opened it up and then refolded it without any cuts into the shape of a bell. Okay. And I'm going to show you, I think, and then he has his, his chop, as it were, in the bottom right, and limited edition of 100. I don't know about the rest of you, but I would have blown my brains out about 
number 22, I think, in, in doing that. Um, this is the way it looks in the exhibit. And I have it on a blue background so that you can see it. And the way I do it is I have pieces of the same type of paper inside the photo corners that are holding the, just if anybody ever wants to exhibit something weird like this, um, I have little pieces of blue paper inside the photo corners. Unfortunately, they slip and then you see some of the white, but I think I figured out tonight when I was scanning how to uh, fix that. And uh, oops. then there's one more item, and this is a dragon card. But I illustrate it because I can't find what I'm looking for. I know I have it because I saw it a few months ago. It tells you my organizational abilities here. Um, back in, what year was this, Dave? Do you remember? Oh. I knew that they were issuing the carnivorous plants, and I had an idea for a cache, but I can't draw. I can put things together. So I called Dave because this is before email and before texting and all the rest of that. And I called Dave up and I said, here's my idea. Can you do anything with this? And he went to town on it, did much better. He keep, and all sorts of embellishments like Perf! up there and uh, the shoe falling off the guy's sock, socked foot and stuff. And I made a nine by 12 dragon card. I made a five by seven dragon card. But I took the original artwork and I had that postmark, but I'm going to find it. And that is going to be the final item, either that or the Liberty Bell, because I think it's uh, the other piece, the um, Wolgowski uh, anagram thing is big and it's unusual and it's probably more weird, but it's not eye appeal that, that something like this or the, uh, the Liberty Bell has. And um, I don't know if you remember, Dave, but this is before you were using computers for your artwork. So it was a real hand-drawn Dave Bennett original. Wow. Nice. And, and I saved it. And unfortunately, it was tossed around. And ah, that's the problem with oversized material is what do you do with it? Where do you store it? Hmm. And that's it.